If we'll get in our Bibles, we're going we're gonna to read the last line of chapter 7 of John. We're going to read from John 7.53 to John 8.11. This sermon is titled, Go and Sin No More. Starting in John 7.53. It says, they went each to his own house, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he, became, he, he came again to the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law of Moses, it is commanded to stone such a woman. So what do you say? They said this to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote his finger on the ground. And they continued to ask him, and he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they had heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go from now on and sin no more. Lord, we thank you, God, for your word and for what you're doing in our lives. Lord, I thank you for this story, Lord, that, uh, that shows some things about our Savior. Lord, it shows that he is just. It shows that he is merciful. It shows that he is good. Lord, I am so thankful for a, a Savior that is personal and mindful of us, Lord. Wretched sinners, God. Lord, I thank you for the fact that God didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but he came so that the world might be saved through him. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so if you've ever heard a sermon on this before, you may have never heard what I'm about to say. If you've ever been in my textual criticism class, which for those of you that are brand new, you will be in that class right after this. So we'll talk more about this. But if you notice in your Bible, when you look down, there may be two sets of brackets that cover the beginning and the end of this section of Scripture. And if you look down in the bottom of your Bible, it might say something like, not in earliest manuscripts. And so you may be wondering, what does that mean? Well, I'm going to tell you what it means. This is not found. This story is not found in the earliest of manuscripts. So if you have a King James Bible, it probably doesn't say that in your Bible. And the reason why is because the King James Bible, which was translated in the 16th century, had a limited amount of manuscripts that it was translated from. This grouping of manuscripts is called Majority Manuscript or, or Textus Receptus. And this is how we get the, uh, the King James Bible. King James Bible is an amazing translation of the Bible. I love it. But there are a few places where there's a textual variance in the King James, and we have to address it. Out of the 6,000 Greek manuscripts we have, only the ones that are around that time period have this story in it. This story was not even, was not even associated with the Bible until the 3rd century. And so that might shake you. It shouldn't. Uh, because there's a lot, of, a, a lot of great evidence that shows that this story is an actual story of Jesus. Almost a complete consensus of New Testament scholars believe that this story is true. It's a story that was told between apostles and it is part of the apostolic tradition. So we can have confidence in it. But it is important that I address this because I promise you, if I don't address this, and some of you have questions about the Bible, someone in the world is going to address it. Listen, we don't have anything to be afraid of. The truth is, uh, is not something, we don't, we don't serve, we're not in a cult. We, we, we're not in the kind of religion where you can't ask any questions. You just got to just gotta block, close your eyes. Listen, we, we serve a, a God who is real. Uh, Christianity is logical, although there are supernatural elements to it. And so we can, the truth can be scrutinized. 
The Bible says if you ask and seek and knock, he will make things clear to you. So I, it would, I would be not a good exegete of the Bible if I did not um, address this quickly. There are an, there's another couple of places where there's textual variance in the Bible, uh, but the two biggest one is the story of the woman in adultery in John 8, and then the longer ending of Mark that is in uh, most Mark. And if you ever read Mark, you'll have the same sort of thing where there's brackets around it, uh, and it will explain to you not in the earliest manuscripts. But for the most part, out of a book that is 2,000 years old, um, there's two places where there's this, this variance. We know the truth about it because we have over 20,000 manuscripts, 6,000 written in the original language, 15,000 written in languages that were around the time period. So I don't say that to give you a school lesson. I just want to frame this honestly before we get into the story. Probably the two most renowned New Testament scholars in the world today, Kruger and D.A. Carson, both believe that this story is a legitimate story of Jesus. I don't have time to explain all the reasons why, but I agree with them. I agree with them. It's not in the earliest of manuscripts, but I also agree with them that this is a story of Jesus. And so that's, that's how we'll start listening to this message. A little, uh, a little uh, uh, theology before we start the sermon. Jesus is focused about his father's business. It's interesting that we focus on a lot of other things about Jesus, but the truth is almost every time a miracle happens or some sort of encounter with Pharisees or anything, it's always coming from or going to teaching. Jesus came to preach the gospel. Jesus came to proclaim himself as the long-awaited Messiah. Jesus taught in the temple. Jesus taught on mountainsides. He was a rabbi. He is a prophet, priest, and king. Jesus came for the message of the gospel and to show himself as, as the answer to all the questions asked in the Old Testament. He is the final prophet. He is the better sacrifice. He is the enduring priest. He is from the line of the priesthood of Melchizedek. He is God by virtue of his indestructible life. And so we can look at Jesus in this regard. But it's interesting because he was there to bring truth to the people. Jesus is focused and about his father's business. And most of the time when we, like, you know, for instance, have you ever seen, we talked about the, the miracle before where Jesus healed the guy um, outside the temple. What happened? They just tried to seize him in the temple so that they could kill him. And he slipped out and they couldn't grab onto him. And what did he do on his way out? He stopped and healed the guy. This is Jesus. Jesus came to proclaim the truth of the kingdom. But Jesus is rich in mercy and compassion. And we'll see that here. Because this woman that's tangled up in this story, she is not the point of the story. She is someone who has swept into something bigger than her. And Jesus handles the greater issue, and he also handle, handles the smaller issue. There are many great scholarly works that explain the, 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 all the details of Jesus and, and all these different points of view, but let's always focus on the fact that he is the Messiah who came to take away the sin of the world. We see in the Gospel of John that there was an ongoing conspiracy to undermine Jesus. They couldn't deny his miracles. They couldn't disprove his teaching. So often they tried to trap him. What was the overarching point of the story that we just read? Jesus is superior to the law of Moses because he is the God of Moses. The idea of upholding the law of God Sometimes Christians, especially in this day and age, view the law as some sort of bad thing or some sort of negative thing. Jesus said in his own, by his own words, I didn't come to abolish the law. I came so that the law might be fulfilled through me. So we, don't, we shouldn't have a negative look at the law of God. We shouldn't, we shouldn't view it that way. It's not a bad thing. But in light of the sinful nature of all men, we should approach the law of God humbly, and righteously. And when we're in a place of leadership, we, we should administer the authority of God humble, humbly and righteously in view of the fact that we too, 
any person that's appointed to be a leader in this world, we too are wretched sinners. Here lies the problem with the scribes and the Pharisees. Because they weren't merely trying to enforce the law because they loved God or they loved the law. It says clearly they only did it because they were trying to trap him. So basically they take this woman's life and not because they're going, man, this is the law of Moses. With tears we must administer the fact that you, you should be stoned. No, they didn't care about that. What they wanted to do was use a person's life to trap Jesus because they were vile and wicked and twisted. <clears throat> this po the point of this story isn't that we should wink at sin or that sin, that there are no consequences for sin. Many modern preachers confuse this story, or many modern Christians who aren't very educated in the Bible, who aren't very contextual students of the Bible, like any time you bring up something wrong, they go, hey man, he without sin, let him cast the first stone. That is an improper use of this. This is not what this is saying. We do not diminish the value and the importance of the holy law of God. The problem is, is these men were not using the law for righteousness. His law is not a bad thing, but it should be used with righteousness and holiness and love in mind, the governing principle. We understand that sin is not being winked at because the very last line of the story, Jesus says, go and sin no more. The problem was that these men weren't interested, the scribes and Pharisees, in the holiness of God. If they would have been, they would have righteously administered the law. When people want to excuse their sin or a, a, a sinful lifestyle, they'll obviously say that he is without sin, cast a first stone. But this is a foolish and clumsy use at best. Or, at worst, it's a self-serving and dishonest use of this text. So these scribes and Pharisees weren't interested in justice, they were interested in being self-serving and dishonest. They were so interested in discrediting Jesus that they would flippantly cast away someone's life without looking deeply and honestly into the matter. This doesn't mean that, that, it doesn't mean that we would have been wrong to stone the adulterous woman or they would have been wrong to stone the adulterous woman. That's not what this text is saying. It's not saying that because she was caught in adultery that it was wrong to stone her. It was saying that the intentions of these men wasn't to righteously administer the justice of God. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman to him who had been caught in adultery, it says, in verse 3. And placing her in his midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law of Moses, it commands us to stone such a woman. So what do you say? They said this to put him to the test so that they might have a charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger in the sand. And in fact, the law does say this. In Leviticus 20.10 it says, If a man commits adultery with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. But the question must be raised. Where's the guy at? Why is the woman standing up there condemned alone? If they want to righteously administer the law, how come the man caught in adultery isn't there with her? This immediately shows the hypocritical nature of the charge. Now, we, we could guess and speculate. I'm not going to, but maybe they knew the guy. Maybe it was one of them. Maybe it was a prominent business person. Or what's more likely is they probably didn't care about this all that often. It was probably always going on. There was probably adultery always in their midst. And no one was being pulled up and stoned all the time about it. But because they wanted to trap Jesus, they wanted to enforce the harshest law they could on this woman with her accomplice nowhere in sight. And this is corruption. This is injustice. This is wicked. <clears throat> there's no such thing as adultery with one guilty party. There's always a temptation to make light of the law of God or to misrepresent the law of God when we look at the things Jesus said and did in the New Testament. This is a mistake. 
We must have a high view of God and the law of God because God is holy. But also because when we elevate God and His law to the proper place, it simultaneously elevates grace and mercy. See, we see grace as this cheap thing that, you know, sure, Jesus died for us. Whatever. Jesus intervened on our behalf because we kind of feel like we half-heartedly deserve it. Elevating the law of God puts things in perspective. It shows the reality of how desperate we are. And so when we elevate God in His law in its proper place, it also elevates grace and mercy. It also elevates the lordship of Jesus. He is Lord and above all. Guess what? He never compromised the law. And despite what Stephen Furtick said, he never broke the law. But he is above the law because he is the giver of the law. He is the Lord of the Sabbath. He is the administrator of the law. He is the authority behind the law. He is Lord and above all things. And it's important that we don't misunderstand that although Jesus isn't subject to the authority of the law because he is the authority of the law, he will not and cannot undermine the law. Why? Because to do so would undermine his divine attributes. I talked about this last week or maybe the week before, but we don't understand why does God have to administer justice? Why did Jesus have to die for sins? Why couldn't he just, you know, give us a pass? And we ask that question because we're not just. We always like the idea of, of justice being, you know, kind of our heads turned to it. Because we're wretched sinners and liars and thieves and self-centered people. We don't understand that God is holy and he cannot deny himself and he will not deny himself. And that's what makes it even more powerful and beautiful. That within, without denying the law, without breaking the law, he fulfilled the law and he did it for your benefit and for mine. He went to great lengths to make salvation possible for us. If the purpose was to fairly administer justice, like I said before, where was the man? Here's another question. Where's the man? But how about where's the godly sorrow? I mean, in our culture today, the criminal justice system is definitely not perfect. But if you are a good judge and someone comes into your courtroom and they killed a bunch of people or they killed a child or whatever, and you have to administer the law fairly, you're probably going to have to put this person in jail for the rest of their life. Or maybe in some states, you're going to get the capital punishment. And so you're sad because this person has wronged many, many people. But at the end, when sentencing happens, this guy, you realize this guy's a person. When his mama comes up and says, don't put my boy to death. Just give him life. See, the truth is, is people who are aware of our own sin, even though God puts us in places where we do have to administer justice, if you're administering an, a, a, a judgment that would take somebody's life, how could you not do it with sorrow? How could you not do it with compassion? Justice must be administered. What are you going to do? Tell the person who, whose uh, kids were killed by this maniac, oh, we're just going to let them go. You can't do that. But on the other side of it, you also have another person's life in your hands. It's a weighty thing. These men could care less about the weight of it. They could care less about this woman's life. They could care less about the law of God. They did not care about God because they were looking him square in the eye and they didn't know who he was. And they studied and they knew the law and they knew all these certain things and this thing that was supposed to represent and, and expose who the Messiah was, they were blind to it. Why? Because they were self-centered and self-serving and wicked just like most of us are until our eyes are open to the truth about God. If the purpose was to fairly administer justice, these men were not doing it. It's a solemn and humbling thing to administer justice. I understand this. I'm not some judge. I'm not a person who's ever had to put somebody, have somebody put to death. But I'm literally in charge of men that sometimes I have to 
let them go to prison because they did wrong here. I have to kick them out of this place because they're, they're, they're not good for the rest of the body. But how can I do that without being humble and solemn about it when I was one of you? And I deserve to be kicked out. And I was a drug addict. And I was a liar. And I was a criminal. And here's the point. That there is no person in the history of the world that doesn't have sin. These men should have been able to, inside of their own sin, even if they had to administer justice, look at this woman and say, I'm sorry, but we're going to have to kill you. <laughs> it's not denying justice. It just shows the heart and sin of these men. They didn't see their own sin, so they couldn't administer justice properly. There's been many times I've had to make hard decisions here, and I've done some of them in tears. It's that guy that I just, man, I hoped he would make it. He decides to go his own way. Trying to talk a dude out of leaving this place because he's mad in an intern as he's facing 20 years in prison. I'm like, dude, don't do it. Open your eyes. Stop being so self-centered. I mean, at least have a little self-preservation. But the wicked, hardened heart is a very, very hard thing to deal with. I propose to you it's impossible to deal with without interaction from the Holy Spirit of God. <clears throat> Matthew 5, 27 says, You have heard it said, this is Jesus talking in the Sermon on the Mount, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better to lose one of your members and that your whole body be thrown into hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into hell. These men were twisted, self-deceived hypocrites. They were willing to set aside justice in the case of the man, which is wicked. And they were going to endorse justice to the letter of the law when it came to the woman and, woman and give her the highest penalty possible, which was capital punishment. So the question is, if mercy was available for the man, then why not for the woman? Because justice on behalf of a holy God was not their motive. And we know what their motive is. It tells us. It says they said these things to test him so that, that they might have a charge to put against him. There's their motives right there. <coughs> Here's something else we must consider. Why would they believe bringing her to Jesus would possibly trap him? I want you to think about this. Jesus was a rabbi. Jesus obviously knew the law, right? So what, why did they believe that bringing this woman to Jesus, who was a, a teacher of the law, who understood the law of Moses, why wouldn't they assume Jesus wouldn't just say, yeah, she's caught in adultery, stone her. Why would they think it would trap him? And here's a horrible indictment about these people. Because they had already encountered his mercy. They had already seen time and time again that Jesus would heal a cripple. And that Jesus was willing to heal a man on the Sabbath. And that Jesus was willing to give blind to the, to the, to the person who was, or sight to the person who was blind. He was willing to feed people for hours on the side of a hill. Jesus was compassionate. Jesus was merciful. And here's the most wicked and twisted thing about these people. They saw that and they wanted to use it against him. How twisted and wicked. Let me propose this to you. How wicked and twisted are we when we've encountered God's mercy at this place, at churches, members of our family, and we have used that to satisfy our own wicked and selfish desires. Think about it. You ain't ever used someone's good nature against them to get what you want? Am I the only one? <clears throat> it was obvious. They did this because he was merciful and kind and they knew that they, that they could trap him. They're pretty clever. They had a pretty good plan. They knew that if they, if they got him to say, listen, don't, don't 
murder this woman. Don't give her capital punishment. They could say, aha, you don't believe in the law of Moses. Thus, you are not the Messiah. But they also thought if he, if he was willing to say that you should stone her, then he would lose favor with the people. And man, that's what they wanted him to lose more than anything. They wanted the people to stop listening to him. They wanted the people not to. But listen, here's the problem is the people who were attracted to him were looking, not all of them as we've, we've seen before, they were looking for something that these men weren't looking for. These 12 men that followed him around, they believed he was the Messiah. And they were willing to follow him. They hated his compassion towards sinners. And this clever move, they hoped would discredit him as being the Messiah. These Pharisees didn't love the law of God. They hated Jesus. You know, there's nothing wrong with enforcing rules because you believe in the rules. A good judge, a good district attorney, a good person, that person wants to see justice. Not get a conviction or not let someone go who don't deserve it. Seeking justice. Here, a person that enforces the rules, if they're doing it for the right reason, they're doing good. There's nothing wrong with, with seeking justice. But these Pharisees didn't love the law of God. They were trying to enforce this because they hated Jesus. Which was because Jesus brought mercy, compassion to, to a groups of people they hated, that they judged, that they thought they were better. But here's the staggering indictment. Because they hated Jesus, it exposed that they actually hated Jesus. God. They hated God. It's funny how you can wear priestly garments and sit in Moses' seat and hate God. Just like the people in our day who invent a version of God that suits them. Those people don't love God either. Here's the problem. You know what someone's feelings about God are when they encounter the Word of God. How, does, how do you react to God's very Word? Are you like the author of Psalm 119 where you can spend 176 verses talking about how you delight in the law of the Lord, how you love the edicts of God, how your life is built around love for God's Word and His command? Can that be said of you? When you are encountered with the, the true version of Christ, and it ruffles your feather because it exposes your sin. Do you hate it? I know people that hate biblical preachers. They'd rather listen to a preacher who says what their itching ears want to hear. Listen, it's the same if you're being ultra legalistic like these Pharisees were. Or if you're creating a version of Jesus on the other side of the street that lets you do you. Both people hate God. Both people hate God. You're looking right at the Jesus of the Bible and you say, that ain't for me. I like, I like the other version of Jesus. I don't like the one who flips over tables in the temple. I don't like ones who say, if you don't eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you can't follow me. I don't like ones that say, listen, you've got to deny yourself. Pick up your cross and follow me. If you don't like that, Jesus, it's because you hate God. Because you love yourself. People who, who have invented a God of their own choosing hate it when they are confronted with the reality of the living God, the biblical God. Verse 7, as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, let him without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote in the ground. Now for everyone who likes to try to use this in every situation of life, the, the, the phrase, let him without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. Let me explain something to you. You are wrong. Typically, we do this for the same reasons the Pharisees wanted to stone her. We like to use this for our own selfish gain, just like they, they used the woman. The law is in place for a reason. The law of the Bible, the law of the land, and we hate authority because we hate being told what to do, because we want to be the Lord of our own life, and we want to do whenever, whatever we want, whenever we want. You can do it with a smile on your face. 
You can do it and everyone think you're a pretty good guy. Anytime you break the law of God and you don't care about it, and there's no repentance for it. Let me give you an example. One that always kind of cuts nice and deep here. There's many men who go through this program who are desperate to get off drugs and they come out the other side of it and they go and shack up immediately with some girl they're not married to and they think they're doing something. Well, at least I'm not on meth. You didn't, you didn't learn about God here. You don't care about God. You found a benefit from not doing drugs. You don't love God. I'm not saying if you ever fall into sin that you're not a Christian. I'm saying that person, he's like, look, we're probably going to get married someday. What do you mean? It's legal now. Come on. We aren't looking for God. We don't want to live for God. We want something in, 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 in this place that suits ourselves. People who think grace and lawlessness are the same thing are fools. People who believe that speaking the truth of God's word is judgmental when dealing with sin are deceived. Jesus doesn't tell us not to make judgments. Jesus doesn't say don't judge anyone. You may have read Matthew 7, 1, but you need to read Matthew 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 because what Jesus says there is don't make hypocritical judgments. The Bible never tells us not to make judgments. You're going to have to make a judgment every day of your life. Should I go over there with him or should I stay here? If God gives you any authority in this life, you're going to have to make judgments. This whole idea of don't judge anybody about anything is in a biblical concept. The Bible says, now here's the thing, there's other places where it says don't judge, but that Greek word has the word condemnation tied up in it. So me making a judgment by saying, listen, if you live a way opposed to this book, then you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. I'm not judging you. I'm just humbly speaking the truth to you. The kind of judgment that the Bible says is not proper is this kind of judgment. There's no hope for you. It's condemnation. I don't have the authority or the power to condemn anybody. My eyes might tell me this dude don't have a shot, but I don't have anything to do with that. And I don't have a right to say that. I can't condemn you. In fact, the Bible says any time, how many times do you forgive your brother? Every time he asks forgiveness. Yes, it does say 70 times 7 in one place, but another place it says, any time he asks forgiveness, you forgive him. Matthew 7, 1 says, Judge not that you will not be judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. That doesn't mean that if you, if you give a righteous judgment in an area of, of someone's life that you're going to be judged back the same way. No, you, if you didn't do anything to deserve that judgment, saying the intention, the way you handle that situation, are you handling it with humility and integrity? Do you want to see true justice? Do you want what's right to come out of this? Or are you out to get somebody? Or like these Pharisees, are you trying to use this authority you have at someone's expense to get what you want? That's a hypocritical judgment. No, it says, listen, judge not that you not be judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. So with the intentions you treat people in your judgments, that's going to be dealt back to you. And it says, with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So guess what? If you don't do what's right because you're trying not to be judgmental, you are also pronouncing judgment on yourself. You're not, you're not doing the right thing. It's like when you say, I don't want to judge nobody, so I'm not going to tell anybody this is going on here. I'm not going to do anything bad, but... I'm also not going to expose him for doing anything bad. The rules say you have to. So now you're living lawlessly. And you think, well, no, the problem is, is you don't want to be labeled a snitch. You don't want to get in trouble. You're not willing to cost yourself anything for the sake of righteousness. And guess what? You want justice in your life, but you're not willing to be just and honest in this situation. God's saying it won't be dealt back to you that way either. Because there's going to come a moment you're going to need the right thing to happen for you. But because you're a hypocrite, it's saying the intentions of your heart will be exposed. Don't judge people and, and treat people. Don't use unjust scales when you deal with people. Be righteous. Be real. Be true. Let me say this too before I say the scripture. Covering up sin isn't mercy. We should always expose the truth of sin. And mercy comes 
Listen, if you, if you came to someone and said, dude, I'm, I know what you're doing and I'm going to tell them, I'm sorry. You did the right thing. You know where mercy comes? It's all out in the open. <clears throat> and this person comes to us and says, I'm sorry I did this. Please don't boot me out of here. And we say, in light of the truth, we're still going to give you mercy. We didn't cover anything up. The truth was exposed. The truth has to be exposed. The truth always has to be exposed. Not just here, brothers. I mean in your life. Every part of your life. Okay. So what does he say in verse 3 of Matthew 7? Why do you see the speck that's in your brother's eye, but don't notice the log that's in your own eye? <clears throat> or how can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye when there's a log in your own eye? You hypocrite. He doesn't say don't do anything. It says first take the log from your own eye. You can't even see. Why are you trying to judge anything? Deal with yourself first, and then you'll be the kind of person that can see good enough to take the speck out of somebody's eye. But here's the thing about these kind of judgments. What are we talking about? We're talking about helping somebody. Justice helps somebody. The truth always helps somebody. Don't be a hypocrite. Don't judge people's weaknesses by your strength. Judge people fairly. Abide by the rules. Be honest. Be a person of integrity in every place in your life. And God says he'll measure that back to you. <clears throat> the other question is, what is the intention of your judgment? Is it based on love for the law of God? Is it based on love for justice? The righteousness of God? Obedience to God? There's been much speculation over what Jesus wrote in the sand. And, and we could just guess. There's, there's no way I... I would even have an idea. But he might have been writing about the fact that Jeremiah said that God would establish justice in the land and he would, he would take all the wickedness and the hypocriticalness out of it. He may have been writing that. Some people have speculated that maybe Jesus was writing the name of the guy that should have been up there. And they were looking down at Some people even said maybe Jesus was writing their sins. We don't know. It doesn't tell us, so we can't guess. But Jesus' reply was brilliant. It upheld the law of Moses, but it also spared this woman. Even though she did sin and she deserved to be stoned, she was really just a pawn in the wicked schemes of these men. He put the weight and the reality of this action back on those who were accusing her. This doesn't mean we shouldn't speak truth about sin, but rather, when we administer justice in this world, we should do it with the awareness that we are sinners who deserve judgment as well. We should always administer the truth and judgment and justice with humility, knowing that it's only by God's grace that we aren't in the same spot. Famously, the, the saying, but for the grace of God, there go I. <coughs> Jesus exposed their intentions, their intentions and their hypocrisy. And in the process, he showed mercy to this woman. In Deuteronomy 13.9 and also in Deuteronomy 17.7, it makes it clear that in the case where capital punishment is the sentence, those who are the witnesses to the crime would be the first ones that had to throw the stone. It's like a ceremonial thing. Hey, we witnessed it was you. And so... Here's the first stone. And then everybody else joins in after that. So he's saying, okay, those of you who are without sin, those who actually witness this, those that want to take the weight of responsibility on yourself, you need to be the first ones to throw the stone at this woman. And isn't it interesting in this mob, there wasn't some justice person who said, I saw it. I know we're here for the right reasons. No. They probably knew that this wasn't even a valid story. They probably knew that, that this woman had been pulled out of a situation that many other people hadn't been pulled out of. They probably knew that these men's intentions were just to shame Jesus, except they went away shamed. Nobody wanted to take the responsibility of being the person who administered the first throw. And it says they left one by one. It's interesting, they say the older ones left first. The ones who had more experience a larger frame of reference maybe of their own sin. 
It says they walked away. <clears throat> Let's get down to the lessons. In this text, Jesus is reestablishing holiness. Jesus is reestablishing righteousness. Jesus is reestablishing justice. The book of Isaiah says, A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. He has come and he will bring forth justice. Jesus came to restore justice. But not justice and righteousness and holiness built on a broken foundation like the Pharisees had built it on, but on a solid rock, the rock of himself. And he was doing this to position the law as a schoolmaster and a path that lead people to his mercy and his grace. Jesus never validates sin. The word of God makes much of sin and how bad and damaging of sin. It says the wages of sin is death. We make much of sin as Christians because the truth about sin has to be seen clearly so that we understand the value and the power and the beauty of the mercy and grace of God. It means a lot that God made an, a way for all humanity to be pardoned. Romans 8.33 says this, Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? Those of us who are called out, those of us who are Christians. Who can bring a charge against us? It is God who justifies. Who is it that will condemn? Christ Jesus, the one who died. More than that, who was raised from the dead who is now at the right hand of God interceding for us. Here's the point about the humility and, and, and the, the broken nature of the way we approach God. We are approaching the judge. We're going in for a blind plea. We're not trying to pretend like, we're not trying to get a lawyer to, listen, the evidence is clear. We deserve the punishment. There is no way out. And listen, in most cases in this society, if all the, 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 the eggs are stacked against you and there is an, a, a, a massive amount of evidence, there's no deal. Usually the deal comes because maybe they're a little concerned they can't make their case. Our case is made against us. So how does it show that the judge himself, the judge himself pardons us? We throw ourselves on the mercy of the judge who will judge the living and the dead. And now Romans is saying, who can condemn us after this? We are being advocated for by the judge himself. Who can make a charge against us? Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But we don't approach God with raised fists and, and, and straight spines and pride in our heart. Like these men did. Give us justice. Oh, he's going to give justice out all right. We got to approach God like this woman did. Broken. Afraid. Need of mercy. Verse 9, but when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. They left. It says in the beginning, the older ones. And then it's just, just this woman. But let me tell you something. Them going away ashamed isn't the same thing as repentance. Yes, their sin was exposed to them by Jesus, but they didn't repent. There's many times that you have to acknowledge your sin. There's many times that you have been shamed by your sin. But there's a difference than having your conscience invoked in a, in a situation that it can't be avoided and what you do with it. Many of us in here have realized we're in the wrong because our consciences, even though they're seared and hard and broken, have shown that to us. But what did we do? Did we go, all right, okay, you got me this time. Like these people did? Or do we bow down under the weight of that sin and ask for mercy? These people came to put Jesus to shame, but instead they went away ashamed. 
Verse 9, but when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I con condemn you. Now go and sin no more. Here's the end. The sin of both parties in the story was exposed. Both people were sinful. The Pharisees were sinful. The crowd was sinful to a, to a degree. The woman was sinful. The, the sin of both parties was exposed. On one side, we see a woman who is broken, contrite. On the other side, we see an angry mob that was proud and self-righteous as they foolishly demanded the justice of a holy God. You know why they demanded justice? Because they were focused on the sin of someone else. They were focused on the sin of someone else. Boy, don't we want things to be set right when somebody wrongs us. But when we're the one, we're the one who's in the wrong, what do we want? You ever walked up to a judge's thing when you're facing a quarter century in, in court and went, Give me justice! If you're guilty, you sure didn't. If you did, you were an idiot. You, did, you didn't do that. If it was definitely known that they were going to convict you, they had videotapes and witnesses and there's no way around it. What does your attorney say? Just be quiet. Don't say anything foolish. When he asks if you're guilty of this, say yes. And then when he asks if you want to accept a plea deal, also say yes. Be respectful. Take responsibility. Anybody ever had a plea deal? I'm, I, I've had several of them. Maybe I'm the only criminal in here. No, there's a few, a few more of us. The, the attorney's advising me. He said, listen, I know. Don't, don't give me this whole song and dance how you're not guilty. If you don't take responsibility for this, they're not going to give you this deal. And it's sort of, it's not really that my heart was right. I just didn't want to go to prison. Or I didn't want to go for very long. It's interesting, though, when we're looking into other people who have wronged us or, or people where, where justice isn't directly affecting us, oh, we always want it. We hear about the guy in the news, oh, man, he, he, should get the, he should get the full max. Or if someone wronged you directly, we'll come up here and we'll, we'll plead around with the staff member for 10 minutes. You ain't going to do anything about this? You ain't going to fire him? I need justice. They were focused on the sin of this woman with no recognition of their own sin. On one side, you see proud, boastful, angry, blind, deceived people. And on the other side, you see a woman who was painfully aware that she was a sinner. And she quietly awaited judgment that she knew she deserved. But quietly and humbly hoped that this man that they had brought her to would show her mercy doesn't say that but how can that not be true her head's down she's on the ground she's crying she knows she's guilty she's not disputing her guilt she's just seeking mercy I'm here to tell you this if you humbly seek God for mercy he will never turn you away ever there's never been one time in history that someone has humbly and honestly repented and sought God and he turned them away. God turns away the proud. God turns away the unrepentant. God turns away the people that feel self-justified or self-entitled. God turns away the people that want to retain authority of their own life. John 3, 17 says, God didn't send his son in the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. He didn't have to come. We see that we already stand condemned before God. Jesus, though, came to seek and save lost sinners, repentant sinners who mourn over their sin. This is why he came, the gospel. Remember in John 5, after he healed the man, we were there a few weeks ago, what did he say to him when he found him in the temple? He said, you've been healed. Now go and sin no more. Don't get tangled back up in sin. I freed you. 
<clears throat> Keep yourself from sin. It always winds down, though, just like it did with the woman, to just you and Jesus. At the end, it's going to just be you and Jesus. In reality, right now, it's just you and Jesus. You're here dealing with yourself. You're not here because you're facing prison. You may think that's why you're here, but that's not why you're here. You may think you're here to get off drugs, but that's not why you're here. You may think that you're here to get restoration with your wife, but that's not why you're here. You're here because Jesus has brought you to a place where it's just you and him. And the question is this. Are you going to take control and responsibility of your own life and buck up and say, yeah, God, but. Or like the woman, are you going to cast yourself on the mercy of someone that has proven that he is merciful? While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It always winds down to just you and Jesus and those who came demanding justice or those who come demanding a miracle or those come, who come demanding bread. God will send them away ashamed. We, we can't demand anything from God. Or are you like the one who comes humbly, broken, contrite? Because if you come the other way, God is going to judge you with the full weight of the law. But those who acknowledge their sin and that they deserve the judgment that's before them and throw themselves on the mercy of Christ, they will be pardoned because the judge himself suffered the penalty of your sins. We're out of time, but I, I just want just to spend one minute basking in the majesty of what I just said. The judge, the righteous judge who knows no sin, who's never been guilty of anything, who's never done anything wrong, who's the creator of all things. Not only did he pardon you, but the way he pardoned you was by inflicting upon himself the wrath that God had stored up for sinful humanity. It's insane to think about. It's completely insane. There may, there's nobody in the world that would do that for you. Maybe your mama. Maybe your mama. Maybe your mama would do that. I'll take his charge. Lord, take me, not him. Maybe. But the problem is, is even if they have the will to do it, they don't have the power to do it. Because they're guilty sinners as well. Even your mama. Even your pastor. Even a godly person who loves you. Even if they're willing to do it. They couldn't do it. The only one who could do it, did do it. And he did it for you. And he did it for me. And listen, we're going to talk about this so many times while you're here. But at some point, if the reality of those words don't impact you, don't break you, then you're in a bad place. And please understand, I'm not talking about an emotional response. I'm not saying if you don't break down crying when I preach that you're not really a Christian. I'm saying if you don't understand the weight of the words I'm saying, you don't recognize it. Just like if you were in a real courtroom... And the judge said, I'm gonna, this guy is supposed to die a capital punishment, but I'm going to take the punishment for him. Like, I mean, what would, how would you walk out of the courtroom feeling? How would you walk out feeling? Grateful? Yeah, it's crazy. Ponder on that. Ponder on two things. To simultaneously understand both things, you have to think about both at the same time. Think about the righteous decree of God's law and that those who break the law of God deserve death. Think about that. And then just reflect on, I don't know, not even your whole life, just the last couple of years of your life. Heck, I could reflect on yesterday or Sunday if you played basketball with me. <laughs> and even though I deserve... So, and listen, I know we're out of time, but brothers... Not even just what I've done. I would, be in, I would be ashamed if you could see inside my mind. If you could see the thoughts I've thought towards people when I've been at, mad at them. The lustful thoughts, the wicked thoughts, the angry thoughts, the self-serving thoughts. I would be, a, I'd be ashamed. And even thinking those thoughts, Jesus said, makes me a murderer, an adulterer. I'm all these things. 
And I think about that a lot because it elevates the power and the beauty of the grace and mercy of God. He who knew no sin became sin. He became a curse for you and me. Lord, I thank you so much for this group of men and their lives. Lord, I thank you for the power of your spirit. Lord, I thank you for the mercy that we see in our Savior, a personal Savior, God. Lord, that got down on our level, Lord. He's not some God, just like cults say, Lord, that have to, we have to do a series of good works and maybe we make it or maybe we don't. Our God made sure we would make it by rolling up his sleeves and getting down in the dirt with us, living with us, walking among us, suffering with us, suffering for us, dying for us, so that all who call upon his name for mercy will be saved. Lord, I pray if there's any man in here who hasn't truly come to the place where they've just let it all go and just called upon your name for mercy and grace, God, that they would do so now, God, or they would do so on the way to the thrift store, or they would do so tonight in their bunk. Paul said, today is the day of salvation because we ain't promised tomorrow. Lord, I thank you for your mercy, God, and your love, and I thank you for the cross. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.